So hello and welcome to a brand new show here on Borough Radio, History on Your Doorstep, presented by me, Graham Lovelock Edwards. But of course it's not all ancient history, and we'll be looking at everything from monasteries, saints and pilgrims through the Victorian docks at Barry, to viaducts and railways, and right up to date with topics like the one we're looking at today, a topic which is a history still very much evolving. As today's topic is the history of aviation and in particular of the RAF here in the Vale of Glamorgan. Its contribution to this county has been massive, certainly during the Second World War and between the 60s and 80s if you lived anywhere between Barry and Bridgend. If you were not employed in the industry yourself you probably knew somebody who was. At their local peak, civil and military aviation institutions in the Vale employed tens of thousands of people, either directly or as civilian subcontractors, which gives you an idea of its reach. So, to help me talk about this rich history and bring to life memories of what it was all about, to be stationed here and how we kept that legacy of aviation in the county alive, I am delighted to be joined by three guests, so let me introduce them to you. First of all, uh, I would like you to say hello to Mark Condren. Hello, Mark. Hello. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you along today. Now, Mark is a volunteer at the South Wales Aviation Museum, uh, but also has relatives who served in the RAF uh, that he's done research on, and we'll be talking more about those. Um, and we'll also be talking about what goes on at SWAM and what you can expect when you go to visit there. Next, we have John Waldron Kelly. Hello, John. Hello. Well, John, I believe you put a few years' service in at the RAF, is that right? Just a few. Just yes. a few? So, so how many in total? Uh, well, Air Force and civilian, 32 years on the camp. 32. So you probably got the hang of it in the end? Just about. <laughs> and how much of that was local? In St. Athen? 32 years. All of it was local. Yeah. So there we go. So lots of things that we can draw on there in, in terms of, of what it was like and what went on. Uh, and also we're joined by Gerard Hancock. Hello, Gerard. Hello. So Gerard, uh, another volunteer at SWAM uh, with expertise in aviation and again with family history it, uh, attached to the RAF. Uh, plenty of things that we'd be drawing on and plenty of things for us to talk about. So look, let's kick off with talking about the very early days of, of aviation and how it was that we ended up with so many uh, air bases in the county. Um, I was quite startled to realise that we had so many. I, I was always aware of, of St. Athen, I was always aware of Flandau, but I didn't realise that including satellites we had four air bases uh, in the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, and from the very earliest days, when, when planning what our role was going to be, of course, aviation was still very much in its infancy. Back in 1918, when the Royal Air Force was formed by merging the Flying Corps and the Royal Navy Air Service, um, aircraft didn't have much in the way of range. So uh, the planning for where different bases should be located was all based on, on what was believed at the time to be the range of, of an aircraft. So the reason we ended up with so many here is partly because being a plateau, the Vale of Glamorgan is very flat and a great place in which to land aircraft. Um, but also because it was believed that it was too far for enemy aircraft to be able to launch an attack, uh, which is why most of the facilities, certainly in South East Wales, uh, were all about training and maintenance uh, and, and the bases further west were there to try and uh, look after U-boats and things like that. So, so certainly between the wars that's when the majority of things happened and certainly it wasn't until after 1931 that we had any presence at all uh, in this area. Now I believe that you've done quite a bit of research um, into, uh, into what life was like for people who were involved in the RAF in the early days. Um, so, Mark, I believe you had two different relatives who were involved in, in the, the earlier days of the RAF, is that right? <clears throat> yes. Uh, first of all, my uh, grandfather, William uh, Condren, uh, served at St. Athen from 1943 to 73. Yeah. And uh, he was based in the storage maintenance unit at the, uh, at the base. Right. Uh, following the end of World War II, hundreds of uh, RAF aircraft were stored here before being broken up. Uh, so we're very proud of my grandfather have his uh, good service certificate on the wall in my house uh, to that. Uh, also as part of my uh, museum uh, and uh, interest in history, I've researched uh, into a great uncle who was my grandfather's brother. My family from the Ronva, my great uncle Jack was a coal miner who uh, just after his 20th birthday in 1940 uh, 
volunteered to join the uh, by the RAF and Bomber Command in particular. Uh, after two and a half years training as a, a wireless operator, uh, he joined 15 Squadron at uh, RAF Milden Hall in the uh, east of England. And unfortunately, uh, on his fifth operation, uh, my uncle Jack was uh, was shot down over the Waddensee in Northern Holland. Right. Uh, recently, uh, during COVID lockdown, I've done a lot of research and using the MOD records, I've been able to piece together a lot of uh, my great uncle's training and uh, operational experiences and um, have discovered a lot about uh, what he went through and uh, and his uh, the rest of his crew as well. Right. So having left the, the coal mine in the Romba uh, and trained at various bases around Britain, um, uh, as I said, he was lost over over the Warden Z. So from a couple of miles below the ground to a couple of miles above it, that's quite yeah. that's quite a leap. It is. So so what sort of things did did did, did they go through uh, in those early days? What what was the progression that somebody in Bomber Command went to it, it, before they went out on missions? Um, well, initially, uh, uh, a lot of people volunteered for uh, air crew, but not all were selected. For uh, despite the the fact that nearly half of the hundred and twenty thousand volunteers of uh, Bomber Command were uh, casualties of the, of the war, um, the the training process was uh, was quite a long one. Say two and a half years. It took my great uncle to to train in his uh, the wireless operator role. So. Um, at the start of the, the war, air crew would have had a pilot and, and an observer who would have been navigator, uh, gunner, and everything else. But as the war uh, progressed and uh, bigger aircraft were brought into service, uh, the four-engine uh, bombers, the uh, Stirling, Lancaster, and Halifax, they needed to have more crew training. And St. Affin as a base mm -hmm. provided the training for almost all the flight engineers who flew in Bomber Command during World War II. Right. Um, a lot of people will be aware of the Dam Buster raid where almost all the, the flight engineers and the crews of the Lancasters and 617 Squadron who were actually trained at St. Affin, so they would have passed through the base uh, in, in, to, during their training. Wow, so this wasn't uh, some, some sort of s satellite operation. What was going on here in the Vale was, was absolutely key to the war effort. Very much so, and the School of Technical Training was a major part of the base of St. Athen, yeah. uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, until well into the uh, later years where, where John would have had experience of picking up trades and so on at, at the base at that time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, great uncle's crew uh, were missing in action. Uh, the, crew, the aircraft has never been found. The, the uh, six of the seven crew members are, are rem in, uh, remembered only at uh, the RDF Runnymede Memorial. Uh, one of the crew members, a Canadian um, air gunner, his body was washed ashore on the Wadzi a couple of weeks after the plane crashed, and he was the only one uh, whose body was ever found. So it's quite a sad story to. Yeah. Uh, to find out that uh, you know the, the the effort and the training that the whole crew went through for, to last only five operations before they were sadly uh, lost. As part of my research, I've been able to find a, a picture of the uh, the um, German night fighter pilot who shot him down. Oh, wow. And um, I have heard instances of, of people who've you know met families of uh, German. Uh, uh, pilots as well mm -hmm. and uh, as part of my search I'd love to meet uh, family members of my uncle's crew but also if I had the chance to meet the family of the German uh, pilots as well. Uh, and, and who knows maybe as a result of uh, a bit of a bit of searching on the internet but I hope, I hope we can we can make that meeting uh, possible that would be yeah. amazing. So also as part of our research um, there's a Commonwealth War Games section at Lund Major Cemetery and there are 33 ga graves there of, uh, of air crew from World War II. Uh, 20 of them actually uh, belong to Spitfire pilots who were training at uh, Landau. So um, most of them were a result of accidents in f uh, foul weather uh, or perhaps during uh, aerobatic exercise, formation flying and so on. Um, so I've re also researched uh, into the background of the, the casualties in the Commonwealth War, War Graves section and uh, as a coincidence some artefacts in our World War II room include parts of some of the aircraft that these people were flying when they were unfortunately crashed and, uh, and killed. Yeah, well, there's a lot. There's a lot of the story of, of the early days of, of the, the RAF at at SWAM, and, and you've got entire rooms dedicated to uh, to memorabilia, to to photographs, the documents, and, and 
uniforms and things like that. I mean, which is which is absolutely fascinating. Um, but we know, uh, Gerard, you, you, you mentioned before that uh, a member of your family was also involved in, uh, in, in making sure that uh, these people in St. Athens were up to the job, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. My, my father, in a little bit more perhaps of confrontational with the RAF role, uh, he was called up in 1944. Uh, he was from Troydru, just outside Merthyr Tydfil, and having been called up into the army, into the Royal Army Service Corps, he was posted miles and miles away to Barry Island. And uh, he had the first part of his service in Barry Island. And then um, one of the things that he used to talk about when uh, we were young children was that one day his unit were used on a base defence exercise where his platoon attacked a machine gun nest manned by the RAF at St. Athen. And he decided that as he was a member of the, his unit's bayonet display team, that they would fix bayonets and charge the machine gun nest. <laughs> and he was very happy to see the, the RAF thinking it was real, um, get out and run away. <laughs> um, so perhaps a, more of a confrontational role than, uh, than the support roles that uh, we'll hear from. Um, the other speakers absolutely but uh, but fantastic to know um, you know that they were put through their metal they were they, they, it was tested even if they didn't come out smelling of roses on that occasion um, you know a very serious operation that was being run there so towards the end of the second world war um, we saw because the Ministry of Defence is obviously a constantly evolving a beast. Uh, as, as the needs change, so do their, their briefs and so do the, the requirements that we have. And we, we see a lot of things coming and going. I mean, for example, uh, in July 43, um, they set up number three overseas aircraft preparation unit in Landau, only for it to be disbanded one year later. So there's a lot of chopping and changing going on. And then, of course, there wasn't so much at the end of the war the same need for the same volume of aircraft. So there was much more vying going on between the bases as to uh, what the roles were going to be going forward. Uh, and it was in um, the, the latter part of the, the 1940s that um, uh, we saw Rus begin to take on more of a civilian role, particularly after the Flandau aircraft disaster in 1950. I mean, something you were talking with me about, Gerard, was how it wasn't clear which which airport was going to be the, the one that would be the commercial one, the one that would, would that would that would take passengers. But that basically sealed the fate of Flandau uh, and set in place Rus as as the place that would be where civilian aircraft would fly from. What well, one thing that fascinates me is the satellite in St. Bride's, because until we started looking at this program, I had no idea um, that was anything there down there at all. I mean, what, what do you gentlemen know about, about that? Well, the, uh, the only thing I know about it is from the book, as you say, yeah. and that it was used, as far as I'm aware, as an emergency landing ground. Yeah. yeah. So as such, you wouldn't block any of the runways at either Landau or St. Athen. Yeah, yeah. And it started off literally uh, a grass strip and a tent was all that was there. But people were expected to, to be based there with those sort of facilities. Um, so that kind of brings us more into uh, the world post the Second World War and more into sort of the Cold War, which is where um, the whole thing took on a whole new life uh, and was, in some ways of viewing it, the sort of, the sort of heyday of, of the base at St. Athens in particular. What were your memories of when you very first came to RAF St. Athens? What, 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 what struck you the most when you first came? The size of the camp. Right. I mean, I arrived here in late 1970 after having done seven weeks square bashing at RAF Swinderby. Uh, for my basic mechanics training, which, if I remember rightly, was 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was just the sheer size of the Forest of TT, which was on the east side, east camp, yeah. as it's called. Um, that was it, just the sheer size of it. Yeah. So, in, in terms of what was there then, what, what, what was RAF St. Athen like at that point? As a, a a trainee, we weren't allowed over to the uh, main site on West Camp, so all we ever got to see was uh, the east site. All the barrack blocks, as you know, have now been 
uh, flattened uh, and a lot of the training hangars have gone as well so uh, it's only a fraction of the size they say it's just the sheer size of it yeah but, uh, yeah and what was your role when you when you first came in as a trainee i was an airframe mechanic right okay and what sort of aircraft were you working on uh, when i left sanathan uh, i applied to go to uh, RAF Valley because it was close to home mm -hmm. and got posted to RAF Scampton on Vulcans which was alright equal distance <laughs> just not <quite. laughs> so, somebody thought it was fun <laughs> yes I went to work on Vulcans right okay so uh, it, it, in, in, in many people's eyes an absolutely iconic aircraft I mean, what was your memory of working on Vulcans <sighs> again uh, as straight out of training was the size of the aircraft yeah i mean she was a a, a big beast and in those days um because we passed out as lecs i went straight on to a um an airframe course to learn the aircraft and its systems right so for the benefit of people not necessarily familiar with it what what you know what were the main assets of a vulcan well she was originally put into service as a, uh, a high-level nuclear bomber, mm -hmm. but with the introduction of very sophisticated surface-to-air missile systems, uh, it had to come down in altitude to be able to survive. And when I went to Scampton, they were just converting over to the low-level role. So in terms of its capabilities then, um it started off as, as, as obviously a, a, something capable of delivering a nuclear weapon. Um, what, what did you see of them when they, ke when they came in? I mean, I, I know obviously they had to be kept in top tip condition, they had to be kept military ready. When, when they came to you, how regularly in the life of, a, of an aircraft would it be brought to St. Atham? Well, every major servicing. Uh, the, normally it's, uh, it goes in a cycle of primary, primary star, primary, primary star then you got minor stars and then every major they'd come to St Athen and it's literally a complete overhaul, take the aircraft apart examine every part of it that can be examined and but what were the quirks of the Vulcan? The quirks? Yeah, I mean surely every aircraft has got those little <laughs> things that uh, you only know about once you take a screwdriver to it and up until that moment nobody knows it's an issue <laughs> The one that people will know about is the Vulcan Howl. Right. When the engines are running, which is on a, a particular variant of the Mark II. Yeah. And a particular variant of the engine that was fitted to the Mark II caused this, uh, as everybody remembers, the Vulcan Howl. Right. And the, the one that's in preservation at the moment, which is a, a running aircraft, XH558, up at Doncaster, you can actually go up there and listen to it being run and the Vulcan howl. Wow. I do remember, I used to go to school in, in St. Athens, and I do, this is in the 80s, late, late 70s, early 80s, and I do recall uh, when they were testing the engines, even though the school was a fair distance, um, the noise was such that the desks would rattle and the teacher just gave up, just gave it, gave it a few minutes until, until the test was over because it just took over absolutely everything. So what, what other aircraft were, or, or, and other facilities that were, that were going on in St. Athens at the time you were there? Well, when I came back, um, I was working on Victor Mark 1s, mm -hmm. and very shortly after that, the Victor Mark 1 was scrapped. So you went on to the Victor Mark 2s, which everybody knows, uh, will know from uh, the Falklands as the tankers. And then after that, I moved on to... Uh, onto the Buccaneers over at West Orchard, which is a, uh, a pair of hangars which are halfway between East and West Camp on the south side of the runway. Right, okay. Now you, you mentioned the Falklands and of course we are commemorating 40 years this year of that conflict. Um, what do you recall as being um, what you saw and what the role of St. Athens was during that conflict? Well, I wasn't here at the time of the Falklands. I was at uh, RAF Honington on tornadoes. Mm -hmm. But having talked to people when I came back in 1984, 
and they were working 12 hours shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they were turning uh, Victor Majors round in, in, I believe, something like 25 days, wow. which is nearly half the time of the normal. That is incredible. Amazing stuff. Um, and in terms, so the, the workload obviously went, went through the roof because these aircraft were being put through their paces and uh, that obviously takes its toll. Um, what did we learn about our aircraft during the, the or as a result of, of, of that crisis? I would say that uh, they went back to old tech in the fact that they took Vulcans out of storage that were due to be scrapped and brought them up to be able to fly the Black Buck missions from Ascension Islands. Right. But knowing what they had to do to the Vulcan to bring it up to modern spec, but yet, what did they drop? Standard 1,000 pound bombs. Yeah. Which were old technology. Yeah, but worked, <laughs> importantly. Yes. Were effective. Yes. Yeah. So what were your memories of what it was like, you know, a day in the life of, of, of somebody serving at RAF St. Anthem? What, what did that look like? A factory. Right. Uh, this is why a lot of people didn't like St. Athen. I loved it. Uh, in, in the Air Force, I did 17 years here after 25 years in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very much like a factory. And it might as well have been double-decker buses that you were working on. But to see that item, f that aircraft fly at the end of that major servicing, yeah. That's what uh, it was all about. And I showed you the photographs of uh, Guy Pearce yeah. doing, doing the um, fly f between the hangars yeah. at the ends of a major servicing. Yeah, and uh, for the benefit of people who, who will be following this on YouTube, we, we'll, be, we'll be sharing the photographs um, that John's got of his time um, at the end of this broadcast. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't all hard work there was a, there was a, a social side to being involved um that you would particularize really we, we, you were djing as i recall is that right yes i, I run a, uh, a mobile disco in part time from 1976 to 79 right and there's a lot of people i spoke to when i said i was doing this show about um being invited to balls and, and to dances and things like that that were that were held at uh, at St. Asper and it was a major part of South, the South Wales social scene. Oh yes, yeah. Fan? The dances here were, uh, how do I say, famous. Famous. Well, people <laughs> still remember them. They're, they're, they're still talked about. Um, and also, you know, there are, there, are, there are things that used to happen on base um, that probably aren't uh, everything that you'd expect. Um, wildlife, for example. Um, there was, there was wildlife that, that made itself known in one of the hangars, is You're that right? You're probably referring to the, uh, the owls. Oh, owls, go on, tell me uh, more. We had um, a pair of owls that used to nest in the corner of the hangar. And uh, the one morning, Monday morning, we came in and you've got all the, the owlets all running around in the middle of the hangar. And everybody's giving it what they can. So they went around the first hour was spent catching these owlets <laughs> and they were transported off to the Welsh Hawking Centre in Barry. Right, so they still, they still, they still got to spread their wings, oh, just yes, yeah. not alongside the Vulcans. And the, <laughs> the other owl we had used to roost in the corner of the detuner, the tornado detuner. Uh, and a detuner when a, when a tornado is running on full reheat, combat reheat, at the back of the aircraft is a very noisy place. But this owl used to just sit there and watch what was going on. <laughs> it was absolutely mad. <laughs> One of the boys, no doubt. <laughs> So look, there's an amazing legacy that we've talked about here with the RAF. We've looked already at uh, the history of how it all came about. We've just heard from John uh, and learned much more about what it was like to be on the ground uh, and to be uh, serving on the base when it was at its heyday. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the ways members of the public were able to interact uh, with everything that was going on here. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, Gerard, your memories in particular of the open days that we used to have uh, at RAF St. Athens. What was your memory of those? Well, all RAF stations on Battle of Britain Day 
had an air show um, back in the 1960s. That's where my involvement with RF St. Athen first started, being brought here by my dad to just watch the, the fantastic air show that would take place every September. And you, you asked John earlier on about um, the quirk of the Vulcan, and one of those quirks was its, its size. And one of the air shows, it was pouring with rain, which was not unusual, obviously, for uh, somewhere so close to Barry Island. And uh, to get out of the rain in the static park, a load of people, a few hundred probably, had gathered underneath a Vulcan bomber <laughs> in the static park. And an announcement came over the tannoy, ladies and gentlemen, please can you move away from the Vulcan bomber? It is not a bus shelter. <laughs> And that was my sort of first involvement, really, of of coming to St. Athens, coming to the air shows. Certainly, I remember. I remember the air shows. It was a, it was a great treat uh, because you were allowed. There was. There, I remember at certainly one event, you were allowed to climb into the cockpit of one of the Red Arrows uh, and have your uh, planes and have your have your picture taken. And I think I must have been eleven or twelve years old. I mean, this was just a seminal moment. It was just so spectacular. Uh, and they were they were they were fantastic events. Well, much as, as as we're not seeing events like that anymore, it's great that the legacy is being kept alive. And of course, uh, you guys uh, at, at SWAM, South Wales Aviation Museum, uh, have got an awful lot to show of of what used to be going on here. I'm mean, Gerard. G- give us a flavour if if for for someone who's not been to SWAM of of, of what its mission is and what it's all about. Well, I suppose the mission of of SWAM is to both educate and excite people. People can come to SWAM and unlike probably any other aviation museum in the UK, they are invited to climb in and climb on the aircraft. We've got display rooms that that talk about history, that uh, that demonstrate the history of both St. Athen and other things, but it's that ability for people to climb into the um, cockpit of what is possibly the most famous F4 Phantom in the world, Black Mike. Wow. Tell us uh, about Black Mike. What was Black Mike famous for? Well, Black Mike is famous for holding the world speed record for flying from Land's End to John O'Groats at, I believe, it's uh, 46 minutes, 44 seconds. Wow. Uh, which is never going to be broken. It's such a famous aircraft that Airfix make a model of that actual aircraft, so you can buy a 70-second scale model of it. You can see it flying on YouTube. It's got its own Facebook page. Wow. Uh, And when you come to SWAM, you can climb up the steps and sit in the pilot seat. Absolutely fantastic. So who came up with this concept then, and, and how did it come about? Well, the concept originally came about because there are two uh, gentlemen who run businesses at St. Athen in the aviation business, Gary Spurs and John Sparks. And like Mark often says to the visiting school children that we have, like they collect stamps, John and Gary collect aircraft. And they decided to put their aircraft together and let people come and see them. And from that idea of, of letting people come and look at aircraft in a hangar, the whole concept that we can do one better than this, we can actually make a permanent attraction and a permanent museum of people coming in and looking at the aircraft. And Gary and John's pious hope is that the children that are coming to sit in Black Mike and sit in the Hunter today are the aviation engineers of tomorrow because that's the business that they're in and they want to encourage that kind of involvement with aviation so that's why it's a hands-on experience uh, and that's where it all started three years ago yeah so i mean you've mentioned some of the key aircraft that are there now what what are the uh, what are the pinups that the, the glamour calls of of swam in terms of the type of aircraft you've got there now uh, well, I've mentioned Black Mike already. We've got a Hunter. Uh, outside, we've got a surviving Shackleton Maritime Patrol aircraft based on the Lancaster airframe, a massive four engined aircraft. We've got two uh, Panavia Tornadoes, a test aircraft, a GR1, and an operational aircraft, a GR4, all housed in the same location. We've got more aircraft arriving all the time. One of our oldest exhibits is a vampire trainer from just after the Second World War. 
We've got a Meteor trainer, which was the, the first uh, jet aircraft used by the RAF, the Gloucester Meteor, during the Second World War. We've got one of those under restoration in our restoration hangar, which again, people will be able to get, get up close and personal with, hopefully in a few months' time. Um, and our latest arrival, gifted from the RAF, is a BAE 146 airliner from the Queen's flight. Wow. Um, so that's having work done on it because it actually flew into St. Athen. It's still an operational aircraft. Uh, it flew into St. Athen. It's going to have some equipment removed from it uh, before it, it's brought over to SWAM and will be available to be displayed to the public. So there's still plenty more to come. It's, it's not a finished project by any stretch. Very much not a finished project. Uh, Gary and John... Um, both have interests in or ownership of aircraft that are elsewhere um, and when funding becomes available those aircraft will be moved to SWAM uh, for display for the public. Am I right in thinking John when you because we took a little wander around SWAM earlier was it the tornado that you saw that reminded you of uh, of, of, of something that you discovered well not you personally but you generally as a unit discovered about the Sidewinder and its, and its, its impact just on um on that aircraft? Oh yeah, that was uh, in the early days of the tornado. They quickly found that uh, with the wings fully swept, if you launched a Sidewinder missile off the inboard stub pylon, it, it quite badly burnt the tailor on. Right, okay. So, one of the early modifications that was happening to the tornado when they came here for their first major was to have the tailorons replaced with a uh, stainless steel leading edge to stop that happening. Brilliant. And of course, it's, it's stories like that that I know a lot of the volunteers who work with you guys, you know, were serving either either here or at, at other RAF bases and are able to share their experiences and things. You mentioned... Yeah, the museum is run by uh, volunteers, uh, many of whom are um, ex-RAF uh, servicemen. We're all aviation enthusiasts and uh, love sharing uh, our knowledge and uh, experience uh, uh, and enthusiasm for the uh, for the aircraft on, on display. Uh, often when we get visitors come in, uh, they are ex-RAF uh, themselves, and uh, it's really great to listen to the visitors telling you about their experience on, on a different aircraft in, in the hangar. And uh, like John was saying, depending on when they served at uh, St. Athen, they would have a partic particular favorite, which is the normally the aircraft they first uh, serviced or first worked on, yeah. uh, but some fascinating memories of, of all of them. Um, the museum is open to uh, the public uh, on Saturdays and Sundays uh, between 10 o'clock and 4, four o'clock. Um, also, uh, we will open up for group visits of all ages. Uh, the museum's motto is inspiring the future by preserving the past. And um, our exhibits and aircraft, uh, you know, go a long way to foster in, in that. Uh, the group visits we have at the museum vary from uh, three to four year old reception uh, groups from schools, Cub Scouts and also air cadets, teenagers and of late we've had quite a lot of visits from uh, adult senior groups in, in the Vale from uh, progress groups in uh, Panaf and Barry and uh, Lantwit Major and so on and we've, in our group visit diary we've got an awful lot of uh, of varied groups uh, coming to visit the museum. They all have a fabulous time. They go on a guided tour of the museum, led by uh, the volunteers. And uh, they, as Jared said, they get to sit in our aircraft uh, and um, really enjoy the experience of being able to press the buttons and flick the switches and uh, you know, imagine that they are flying the, uh, the aircraft in the, in the collection. Sure. Now, obviously, this you know, here we are in the Vale of Glamorgan, only a stone's throw from where these air bases were. There are no doubt uh, plenty of people in this area who have uh, connections with, uh, with with the RAF. I mean, are you still looking for volunteers and people to come and help out at the museum? Yes, very much so. And um, the great thing is about uh, working at the museum as a volunteer, you haven't got to like aircraft. You've just got to like working with people. So anyone who's out there who wants to spend a very entertaining 
day on the weekend or a couple of days on the weekend just chatting to people chatting to excited children and facilitating them looking at the aircraft they're more than welcome it's not just restricted to people who need to know things about the aircraft because everything that you're going to ask about the aircraft is actually written down on display boards next to the aircraft anyway so we would encourage anyone who has got that kind of interest in either working with aircraft at a museum or just coming along to work at a museum to, as a volunteer to, to help people enjoy the experience, please come along. Absolutely. So if anyone listening to this wants to go to, uh, to have a little look around SWAM, either as an individual or as a group, what's the best way of them being able to take that forward? Uh, check out the uh, SWAM website and uh, you can contact the museum uh, to arrange a visit or check up on, on opening hours. Um, as well as meeting the public, we also have volunteers who are involved in the restoration side of the aircraft. So uh, during the, the week, um, they uh, work in, as Gerard said, at the moment on a, a meteor, previously on our Shackleton, uh, a Wessex helicopter has just emerged from the restoration hangar and is on uh, display in, in the museum. Uh, so anybody uh, who with any interest or experience in aviation would be more than welcome to, uh, to join us. Uh, they are uh, a really great bunch of people and uh, uh, obviously very much enjoy being in Shiver's company and sharing these wonderful aircraft with, uh, with the people. Yeah, I must say, from the times I've been down, it, uh, it, it does seem to be a nice atmosphere. Everyone, uh, It reminds me of a big pit, but obviously about aeroplanes. You've got that same sort of banter and camaraderie between people there, which is, which is great. But if you want to use the big pit analogy, um, as you did earlier on, it's from several hundred feet underground to several hundred feet above ground. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So and we cover it all here in Wales, don't we? So there we are. So look, that's amazing. Um, we, are, we are coming to the end of our discussion, um, but um, I'm really grateful to my guests, John Waldron Kelly, Mark Condren and Gerard Hancock uh, for the conversation we've had today about the RAF and aviation here in the Vale of Glamorgan. It is spectacular. What a massive, massive effect. Uh, that, that it has had here, the number of lives that it's been touched. And if you have experiences of, of having served with the RAF or, or, or an involvement one way or another that you'd like to share, please get in touch with us at Bro Radio, either on social media uh, or by snail mail if you like, um, because we would love to hear your experiences and we would love to share them. Um, we come to the end of this particular programme. The next edition will be at the same time next month uh, in June when we're going to be exploring one of the most fascinating historic buildings in the Vale, Fon Mon Castle, the only stately home I'm aware of where there is both a portrait of Oliver Cromwell and Charles I hanging in the same corridor. Mixed loyalties? Well, find out more next time here on History in Your Doorstep on Bro Radio, Loving the Vale. Mm-hmm.